Hi, welcome back to Galatians, a City Rise series. My name is Bradley, and today we're going to be studying Galatians 5. So if you'll open up your copy of God's Word and read along with me, we're going to read Galatians 5, 1 through 12 to start. For freedom, Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. Look, I, Paul, say to you that if you accept circumcision, Christ will be of no advantage to you. I testify again to every man who accepts circumcision that he is obligated to keep the whole law. You are severed from Christ, you who would be justified by the law. You have fallen away from grace. For through the Spirit, by faith, we ourselves eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision counts for anything, but only faith working through love. You were running well. Who hindered you from obeying the truth? This persuasion is not from him who calls you. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. I have confidence in the Lord that you will take no other view, and the one who is troubling you will bear the penalty, whoever he is. But if I, brothers, still preach circumcision, why am I still being persecuted? In that case, the offense of the cross has been removed. I wish those who unsettle you would emasculate themselves. The first thing that I want to note here is that we stopped at verse 12, and this is kind of just a fun little note, but the ESV actually continues all the way to verse 15 before the next heading, but the NIV ends this section at 12. If you've ever wondered, those little like titles that you get at the beginning of a chapter, or in this case, like halfway through a chapter, that those are not in the original text. Those are added by the editors, which is why the ESV and the NIV disagree here. There's a word for those headings. They're called pericopes. So the pericope that we just read, uh, we actually cut short according to the ESV, but the NIV, uh, we, we did it exactly how they have it uh, designated. And that's just a fun word. That one's for free. You can take that one and learn from it. Let's dive now into, into the actual text of it. I love verses two and three here. Look, I, Paul, say to you that if you accept circumcision, Christ will be of no advantage. And then he goes on to say that if you accept circumcision, you're obligated to keep the whole law. And this is just a, a really important reminder and a powerful message from Paul to the Galatians that that the law is not this evil, horrible thing, but it is not as powerful as, as, as Christ. It's not as powerful as Christ's death and resurrection. And so when, when you lean on the law, you lean away from Christ. If you imagine being like in the middle of the law and of Christ, you can only lean one way. And, and Paul's kind of saying, you, you're allowed to lean on the law, but the law is not going to hold you the way Christ will. And, and that's not even what the law was designed to do. Another thing that I love is verse seven. Uh, you were running well. Who hindered you from obeying the truth? Man, the, the truth is that what you and I are called to do is to run the race well. The race in this instance is obviously our lives and we're supposed to run it well. And we could probably disagree and split hairs on exactly what that looks like in every instance of our lives. But when we as people think, man, what am I supposed to do with my life? What am I called to do? Really, it's an important reminder for us that, that the ultimate calling on our lives from God is to run the race and to run it well. Not to, to ease up in the last mile, not to, not to go really hard at the beginning and then take it easy, but just to run the race well all the way through. And, and that's, it sounds easy, but as we all know, that's, that's a really challenging task. I also, in verse nine, I love this. I'm gonna pull it up here. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. This is like, I feel like this is the old timey version of a, a bad apple spoils the bunch, right? A little leaven will leaven the whole lump. If you add a little bit of yeast to dough, all of the dough will rise. That's what yeast does. In this case, uh, the leaven is a bad thing. And in verse 11, Paul, or rather in verse 10, uh, Paul says, I have confidence that you will agree in that whoever is troubling you, whoever it is that is leavening the lump, that they are going to face the consequences of this from God. We're really quick to jump over this, but I think this is worth noting. A little leaven will leaven the whole lump. A little bit of gossip will ruin the whole group. A little bit of, of hate will, will tear apart an entire team. We all, all of the dough, the entire lump faces the consequences of the leaven, but it is only the one who leavens. It is only the one who gossips. It's only the one who hates that immediately faces consequences from God. And, and, and finally, in verse 12, uh, this is just a, Another one that's for free. This is another fun one. I wish those who unsettle you would emasculate themselves. I'm also going to read this in the NIV. I think this is a little bit more graphic of a translation. As for those agitators, I wish they would go the whole way and emasculate themselves. Obviously, on the topic of circumcision, uh, I'll leave it up to you to figure out what he means when he says go the whole way and emasculate themselves. 
But this is serious that this is the level at which Paul uh, takes this topic. This is not just a like, oh, you disagree, I disagree, whatever, we disagree, agree to disagree. No, Paul is saying like, I wish they would physically harm themselves for the things that they're doing. It is so vile, so evil, and so wrong. I often wonder if we, in our context, in, in, in the modern day, if, if we treat the gospel with the same severity that Paul did. Uh, I know that I don't. And so this is an important reminder just how serious Paul takes the gospel and thus just how serious you and I should take the gospel. We've got a couple questions for you now to discuss in your group and they'll be on your screen.
Let's continue now in reading from Galatians. Follow along with me in your copy of God's Word, Galatians 5, 13 through 18. For you were called to freedom, brothers. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, watch out that you are not consumed by one another. But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. There's just a couple things that I really love in this section. The first one we find in verse 13. Uh, you were you were called to freedom, brothers. Don't use this freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. Freedom is an amazing thing. It's one of the things that we value the most as Americans. And we have freedom from God through Jesus Christ. And that's a beautiful thing and an important thing. But it's also something that we can abuse. It's also something that we can take advantage of. And, and Paul gives us an important reminder here. You have freedom. Do not use it as an opportunity for the flesh. And in our next chunk, he's going to explain what he means by opportunities of the flesh. But don't use your freedom to run rampant. I, I imagine the a thing that you hear sometimes from Christians. We're like, well, I can do that because Jesus will forgive me. And it's like, well, yes, that's true. Jesus is going to forgive you, but that's not the reason you've been given this freedom. Paul says in this very book, are, are we to sin to allow grace to abound? By no means. The freedom that we have from Jesus is not a freedom to sin excessively. It is a freedom to do exactly what Paul says here, through love, serve one another. And how serious do you think Paul takes this, this love and service of one another? Well, look at what he says in verse 14. The whole law is fulfilled in one word or, or one command. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. This is the whole law in one command. Love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus was asked, what is the greatest law? And he responded, love God with all your heart, soul, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. And here, Paul is actually, it seems that he's saying, if you love your neighbor, you will only love them because of your love for God. He's, he's taking the love God out and kind of folding it into the love your neighbor part. There is one law for you and I to fulfill, to fulfill all the rest. Love your neighbor as yourself. That is how we faithfully obey God. And ultimately, that is how we faithfully run the race well that we talked about in verse 7. Uh, finally, looking here at these, these final verses 16 and 17, if you walk by the Spirit, you don't gratify the desires of the flesh. Paul juxtaposes the desires of the flesh and the desires of the spirit. He puts them against each other because in your life and in my life, these things are against each other. You, similar to the law and the Christ leaning one way or the other, you can either desire uh, the flesh or you can desire the spirit. And, and your actions can only go one of those directions. And when you lean one way, you lean away from the other. This is a this is hard, honestly, because there are things that we enjoy in our lives and it can be difficult to parse out. Well, I'm enjoying this thing. Does that mean it's of the flesh? Like, do I need to become a monk and shave my head and only eat like rice and beans? Like what, what are the steps here? And, and, and it can be tricky because you can get down that rabbit hole really quickly of completely avoiding all pleasure. I don't think, personally, I, I, I don't think that's what Paul's talking about here. I think as we move into this next pericope, we'll see exactly what it is that Paul means by works of the flesh and desires of the flesh. And so we, we can rest now knowing that he's gonna unpack that a little bit further, but it is important for us to remember that there are times in our lives where we are picking uh, something of the world over something that is of God. And, and sometimes that's okay, or sometimes that's not as direct, where, where we're spending times with friends where, where maybe we could be reading our Bible and the Bible seems more spiritual, but it is important for us to spend time with friends but there are also times where we pick things that we shouldn't be doing over things that we could be doing, where, where rather than going and, and serving at our local church or at the local food bank or, or whatever it is that you do as an act of service, we decide to stay home and just take a nap because I'm just a little bit too tired. And, and I think that is where we have to find the balance. We have to figure out which, which of these is good for us. When is it the right time to rest? When is it the right time to plug in with friends and a faith group? And when is it the right time to serve or to study, or to praise God. That's it for this Pericope. We've got some questions on the screen for you to talk about in your community groups.
Now we're going to dive into this last chunk, or as we learned today, pericope of scripture. Follow along with me, Galatians 5, 19 through 26. Now the works of the flesh are evident, sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. I warn you as I warned you before, those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things, there is no law. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. Obviously, a very famous passage of Scripture. Here we get the fruits of the Spirit. It's one of the first uh, passages of Scripture that you memorize as a child, right? We, we probably all have maybe a different song, but it's, it's normally put to a song and we teach it to children, which is really important. But just before the fruits of the Spirit, we get to this long list of sins. And to give a slightly technical term for this, this is what we call a vice list. These are vices, and, and this is a list of vices. Paul is warning, these are things that you should not do. At the very end of this list, he says, actually, you shouldn't just not do them, but if you do them, those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. This is not merely a, oh, don't do that. It would really be a bummer. This is, don't do that, or you will not inherit the kingdom of God, which is really powerful. In this vice list, there's a couple things that are really interesting. Uh, depending on your version of the Bible, you might have a footnote uh, right after the word envy. Uh, down at the bottom, it might say some manuscripts add murder. This is just a fun little note, but the words envy and murder in Greek are only one letter apart. There's just an added letter in envy that gets you to murder. And so some of the early manuscripts have envy and not murder, and some of them have envy and murder. Uh, that is why we leave murder out. It seems what happened was that a scribe was writing envy and then looked at envy again, realized that he had just written envy, but added murder because it looked like murder. Who knows? But that's why murder gets left out. It's probably not in the original text, but it does get added in some translations. Another thing in the original language that I think is really fun is uh, the word uh, witchcraft or sorcery, depending on your translation. Uh, that's a weird one because it's one of the few on here that doesn't really fit our day. I don't know about you. I personally have never, I don't even think I've met a witch, much, much less uh, performed witchcraft or potions or sor sorcery in my free time. Uh, it's not something that we see a lot of. But if you actually look at the original Greek, uh, th this word is pharmacology, uh, pharmacies. And so sorcery, witchcraft, Really what Paul is getting at is drug use. And if you think about drugs and how they work, it makes sense why an ancient thinker would equate them to sorcery. A, a, a smoke or a powder or something that makes you feel different and changes the world around you, it's, it's quite clear uh, how that mistake got made. Uh, but those are just some interesting notes. What I love here is that Paul does not just say, hey, here's things you don't do, and then he moves on. He says, here's things you don't do, and here's why you won't inherit the kingdom of God, and he offers a solution. Here's your vice list. If you do these things, you don't inherit the kingdom of God. So you don't want to do these things. So Paul, what do you want me to do? Well, here's what I want you to do. I want you to have the fruit of the Spirit. Fruit we see throughout the Bible as, as being used to mean works because a tree produces fruit and a tree only produces the fruit that is of its kind. What I mean by that is that if I plant an apple seed, I would not expect that tree to grow oranges because it's an apple tree and apple trees grow apples. And if you are, are planted in the spirit, so to speak, you will show fruits of the spirit, which are love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. If the fruit in your life, if the activities and actions and works of your life, the fruit hanging off your limbs, so to speak, if those things are drunkenness or fits of anger or jealousy, you're not planted in the spirit, you're planted in the flesh. But if, if the actions of your lives involve peace and joy, self-control and gentleness, that's a good thing you're, you're planted in the spirit. And Paul gives us this as almost a litmus test of if, if you see more spirit than you see flesh, that's a good thing. If you see more flesh than you see spirit, 
that's a bad thing. Obviously, this is always a continuum. Every day of our lives, we, we are pruning the limbs of the vice list and, and we are attempting to grow limbs of the spirit. And limbs there being not literal limbs, but tree limbs to continue Paul's metaphor. And another thing that I love is, is right after this, we have verse 24. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Oftentimes in our lives, it can be really difficult to kick a bad habit, to, to end an addiction, or, or just to, to get rid of some of the, the evil and nasty and, and gunk, if you will, in our lives. But for those of us that are with Christ Jesus, those things have been crucified with him. When Christ went to the cross, your enmity, your sexual immorality, your strife and jealousy and fits of anger, anger those things went to the cross with Christ and they went into the grave with Christ and they did not come back out on the third day. And I just love that reminder, the way that Paul is like in a very roundabout way, he's just giving you the gospel one more time. This is what it means to be a Christian. For your sins, for your passions, your earthly desires, they have died with Christ. And finally, if we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. This is a beautiful phrase. I love this in the original Greek. It really just means to march with the Spirit, not just walk alongside, but to be in step, in tempo, every step along the way that you take, you're with the Spirit, never deviating and, and never going off of that, that tempo. Um, and then finally, let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. That's a hard one because I know in my life, a lot of times when I've taken big leaps in my faith, it's been very easy for me to to want to wanna boast in those things, which is a you know hilariously uh, oxymoronic. But I, I want people to be proud of me, of the things that I've accomplished, of the ways that I've changed. Paul here is saying, hey, it's great. When, when, when you're able to, to trim the vices and, and to grow fruits of the spirit, but don't be conceited. Uh, don't provoke one another. Meaning if, if you have some fruits of the spirit and you know someone who doesn't, don't provoke them. And on the flip side, if you don't have a fruit of the spirit and someone in your life does, don't envy them. Don't look at them and go, man, I wish I was that way. I, I, I wish I could do that. Why are they that way? And I'm not. I think what Paul wants us to do is to just recognize that that some of us are further along in our journey or, or maybe just further along in certain areas than others. This is not a race uh, that is a competition. When Paul said in verse seven to run the race well, he's not meaning that you and your community group sitting next to people, that you're trying to beat them to the finish line. That That's not the goal. The goal is to just run the race well. Some people started earlier than us in the race. Some people started later than us, but are faster runners. There's no need for us to boast in our position in the race, just as there's no reason for us to look at those beyond us and to be worried about their position in the race. Because our job is not to win the race, it's to run the race well. Here's a couple questions for your community group to talk through.
Hey, thank you guys so much for joining us in Galatians 5 here at the City Rise series through Galatians. A final parting note for you is as we reflect on the fruits of the Spirit, I want you to imagine this. Someone moves in next door to your family. You don't know them, that you're, you're not familiar with them, you don't know where they came from and you have no mutual friends, but you walk over there and you shake their hand. You say, hi, my name is, whatever your name is, and, and you start to have a conversation and they tell you that they are a very strict follower of a, a, an ethical system. Maybe they're you know, devoutly for animal rights or, or, or they always weigh the consequences or no matter the consequences, they refuse to do something that they deem immoral. You can, you can place any ethical system into this thought experiment. And I think that the most powerful one, I think the person that I want moving next door to me and my wife is the person who has the fruits of the spirit. I don't know how you weigh your moral decisions, but for me, I think the most powerful way to live is to be a person that lives with love, joy, peace, and patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. I hope that you agree with me, and I hope that together we can continue to grow those fruits in our lives. I've had a blast going through this book with you and going through this chapter with you today. We're gonna go to Galatians 6 in the next video, and I'll see you there.